that will help us to uh, uh, do our jobs and instruct others. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned in the newsletter, uh, if you noticed, and I'll just, uh, again, very briefly before we start, I'm going to cut it out of the, the uh, video we post. If you know somebody, especially younger guys and gals that are new to the industry that don't know about the BDR, uh, please pass the word. Uh, we don't get into the regular mailroom paper box because we're on the web and reaching out to folks that don't know about us. I get letters, oh, I'd say every week, I'll get a letter from someone that says, I was just told about the BDR. Wow, um, now I have to spend my weekend reading. That that warms me a little bit. Uh, it's so hard to get writers these days. Everybody's so busy, but we try to keep it up. You may notice down here in the corner, uh right there uh, richard rudman's uh, piece which i think is really a good one you know is it us versus them or is it us together that carries on our discussion that we had over the past couple of weeks about eas radio being competent during emergencies and uh, what we can do it's not the whole story and there are things that we should be able to do richard and i are talking about it and uh, we'll we'll have another discussion uh, maybe after this October 4th debacle. Um, enough said about that right now. Hey, it's Jeff Welton time. It's always great to welcome Jeff to our uh, meetings on the first Thursday of the month. And Jeff is here with some good information. Uh, one of our uh, listener readers, watchers, has asked for an update on the AUI and also some of the tools that are involved in the AUI. And so I've kindly asked uh, Jeff, he would look into this for us. Uh, Matt has moved on to another position. Uh, so we're awaiting uh, to uh, see who will take his position. But in the meantime, Jeff can talk about that. And uh, next week at IBC, uh, nor tell us a few things they want to tell us about. And Elaine can even chip in on that and tell us a little bit about the newest things that will be coming out of uh, Halifax. So, uh, Jeff, let's start with you. All right. And, and Elaine can probably tell you more about it than I do because she works with the marketing folks and I just usually cuss them out. Uh, but uh, so I'm going to. Uh, I wanted to give Elaine a little notice so we didn't just put her instantly on <laughs> in the spot. But Elaine, we're coming to you in about a minute and a half. Yeah, no pressure. You are? So, <laughs> we is. All right. So if you can uh, turn on the screen share, and Barry, I'm going to oh, uh, just uh, flip a couple of different screens up as we go because it's uh, a little easier, especially when you're talking about the AUI. And uh, I'm going to break the rules a little bit and sneak into some of the, uh, I guess, Backdoor protocols uh, give you a little insight into how that stuff happens when we get to that, too. Um, for right now, am, am I showing the right screen, the one with the picture of the uh, IBC booth map? Yes, sir. Cool. So this is, uh, we, we'll touch that real first real, real quick. Um, IBC is in Amsterdam, of course. Uh, it's cool because it's in September, NAB's in uh, April, of course, and so we, with a six-month spread between the two, depends which way, five and seven, whatever, you will sometimes see some things at one that you don't see at the other, right, or like until the next year, so it can be a little sneak peek. This year, I don't think there's a whole lot really, really new um the vx series we're showing it as new because the high power ones started shipping last week so if anybody's got an order in for one of those hopefully the backlog i see wilson applauding in there because we've been dealing with the when is my transmitter going to ship question for a whole lot of months so uh seeing them start to go out the door is always a good thing uh AUI, the VX is cool because it has the new flash free AUI in it. So instead of like Matt, historically, you know, we're showing you a beta of what's in a VS in his uh, room. And uh, today I'm going to be tied into a production transmitter in the office through VPN and uh, playing with an actual working going to a customer transmitter. 
So that's uh, that's kind of cool. And I'll show you the roadmap so we can all be disappointed together in how long it's going to be. Um, <laughs> all right. Elaine, we're going to pop over to you for a few moments now. Please talk to us. Let's see. Okay. Yes. Nothing quite like being taken by surprise. Um, so <laughs> uh, I, I have... Uh, as people here probably know, I've been assisting Nautil with PR, et cetera, for what, Jeff, about 15 years now, something like that? Well, no, because you weren't, you were older than 10 when you started, so it can't be more than two or three. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, for, for the upcoming IBC, really the, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of little news items there that uh, those of you who went to NAB have already heard and seen the, the main thing being the VX and, uh, the excitement over the uh, low and high power systems now shipping. And I will say that when I was at Nautel in July, I saw stacks and stacks of VX transmitters in final test, and that was exciting. I really, I really enjoyed seeing that. Um, the other little note, something that kind of quietly came out this year is uh, the SC4 um, switchover, uh, controller, which I guess is a partnership with Davicom to have that come out, but it's being uh, branded as a Nautel product, the Nautel SC4, so you can look that up on the website. And uh, what am I missing, Jeff? I mean, we've uh, they're, they're doing uh, just a lot of uh, commentary and events uh, around uh, DRM, which of course is the big digital mode uh, in much of the world, and uh, we'll be talking about that uh, during, uh, I think it's an event on Saturday of the show. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess a, a little uh, a little plug for a webinar that Nautel's got coming up. I put out a little uh, news item about uh, some of the amazing things that Nautel and Orban have achieved jointly with uh, power savings uh, over MDCL with AM. So uh, uh, that's kind of it from this end. I'm going to throw it back to Jeff. Yeah, and without uh, regurgitating the whole webinar, I guess it'd be more of a sneak preview. That webinar is on the 20th, I think. Um, is that right, Elaine? You're asking me? Yeah, there you go. See, we don't know, but I'm pretty yeah, sure it's no, the 20th. It it's, yeah, it's yes, Wednesday. It's the 20th. Yeah, Wednesday yeah. the 20th, yeah. So um, I'll, I'll talk a little to that as well, because it is up on our website. Uh, if anybody gets our Waves newsletter, that just came out yesterday, and it talks to the MDCL. Uh, and they've got what uh, – so this is marketing versus real world. They're calling it a promotion. I'm saying, no, it's just the way the system works. But, uh, but I'm more than happy to work with you on uh, figuring out, you know, what it'll save. Um, and MDCL is one of those things, you love it or you hate it, but there's not a lot of in between. Um, I guess if you pay the power bill, you love it. If you don't like uh, carrier shift, you probably a little less so. Um, so, but we, we will talk about that. Um, let's see, the other thing we're showing in uh, IBC that we do show here, but not nearly as much as we probably should, is the Digidia Span FM and Sync FM. Digidia is a French company that we bought two, three years ago, Wilson, about that. Nod, nods his head, that's a good sign. And uh, one of the things they're good at is doing uh, Sync FM, so synchronized FM transmission, where you sync the carriers, the pilots, the audio, and for fill-in boosters, things like that. And so we've uh, we've been playing with that and evolving it a little bit from the European standards to more of a North American market, and that'll be cool to see where that goes. And that's uh, that's very much a, a work in progress. Um, Elaine is right; it is the SC4, and the SC4, for what it's worth, is essentially a uh, Davicom Cortex chassis that's uh, stripped and configured to fit specifically with our gear running uh, SNMP. So you can do main standby or N plus one configurations and uh, get something that's a little more purpose oriented. All right, so AUI, let's hit the elephant in the room early because this is the fun one. Thank um, you. You what? Thank you. What's that, the elephant in the room? No, talking to us about a UI that everybody wants to hear. 
Look, I've, I've told people at this point, if I am asked to you hold a gun to my head, tell me when the AUI is going to be all done, I, I'll flat out tell you, hopefully before I retire in seven years. But um, don't hold your breath. Uh-huh. Now, it is really nice to see it out on the VX series. Uh, so this is the part where everybody just buckle your seatbelt and promise not to call me names and don't tell the engineering guys that I showed you this screen. Um, this is the engineering roadmap for AUI. And it uh, it starts way back. I'm going to have to scroll over. But starts way back in uh, early, mid-2022. It gets updated on a regular basis. Uh, pro, the, um, the priority has shifted so many times that it, it's just, uh, I'm surprised engineering isn't just all up and quit. Um, the good thing is what you're looking at here is a very pessimistic view because we've doubled the size of the software team in the past six months. So now everybody knows you hire a new guy, you got a learning curve. They're not going to just walk in the door and start rolling out code. So it's going to come down, but it's not going to come down fast at first, at least. Uh, the goal is right now they're getting ready to start the GV betas and they hope to, and you'll see a lot of code names in here. I'm leaving it purposely small, but uh, the, um, you'll, you'll see that uh, the goal is to have GV done and dusted before January, uh, by January, let's say the end of January, pessimistic, let's say the end of February, cut me some slack here, because we've already, you know, missed every target we've had. I, I see no reason to stop that uh, at this point. Um, VS should follow behind that. They're showing beta four and beta four will most likely be the final by mid next year. And yeah, that's how many years past what we said it was going to be originally. Anybody want to take a guess? Oh, Ken, you need to hold up more fingers than that, buddy. Yeah. Um, Bill is closer with all five of them. It, it's so we started working on this in 2017 for Sirius. And this is more than a few days after that. Um, the other stuff isn't, uh, so let's see, we got NX low power coming after that. Other stuff, they're redoing that map. Actually, the meeting is this afternoon, so I'll have more information by tomorrow, but uh, I wanted to show this much anyway. So this is where that's at right now. Now, where is it as we speak? Well, I've got the VX, I think it's a 600. Oh, one thing that has changed for us old people is that you can actually see your darn password now as you're putting it in. Uh, by the way, the default password is change me. So that that's uh that that's Matt. That's Matt's legacy there. It's a subtle, subtle thing. Nova Scotia passive aggressive. It's like Minnesota nice. Um, hopefully Justin hasn't unplugged his transmitter. Let's find out, shall we? I see modulation flashing, so give it a moment or three. And remember that right now I'm running uh, on a VPN back to the office where the internet speed is much, much worse than it is here in my home office. So next time I'll bring the darn transmitter home with me. Let's do a refresh and see if we can speed that up any. Yeah, it's funny, I was talking to Wendell earlier and he was in the office and uh, we're trying to refresh the same screen and mine came up close to five minutes before his did. Yeah, let's turn RF on. Okay, so the RF's up. What I am not seeing is, let's go to the home. There we go. I was just wasn't on the home screen. So this is what the new AUI looks like. It's very similar to the old one, except we want white background instead of black. Um, I'd like to see that switchable and it's on the wish list, but it's not there yet. Um, most of the controls and settings are the same. You've got the ability to look at, I like the baseband better, but you do have the ability to, um, look at the, uh, at the, uh, comp or the, uh, output as well. Yeah, I know. Change, save that. And we should be good. So you can look at the actual, uh, transmitter uh, output as well as the, uh, baseband. I forget what did I set the span to. Click, grind, thousand kilohertz, so megahertz. 
And let's go back to the baseband because that's the one that makes sense to me. Save and save, close. So like on the baseband, you can see the L plus R, the pilot, the L minus R with the pilot suppression. What you don't see is RDS because it's not turned on. Um, we do have the ability and for us older people, this is frustrating as hell, but uh, it's very icon oriented. And, and I say older people, Matt's older than I am, but he loves this stuff. So uh, you um, want to change a preset. So let's pick, for example, we've got one preset here. So let's make another one and add RDS. So I'm just going to clone it. It'll take a second or two. Now I've got two presets. We can give it a new name. Let's go to edit. And let's call it preset with RDS because I'm really creative when it comes to this stuff. If anybody has any questions or anything, just unmute and holler at me or uh, bring it up live in the chat. But, well, raise, so, raise your hand if you'd like, and uh, we'll remit, we'll note to call on you. There you go. David, that means you. So let's see. Does anybody give me a PI code? Uh, let's find one then. PI code generator. W9WI used to be the good one, but his website has changed and that uh, can't be tracked anymore. Let's go with CKVE, see if I can do my own. All right, so the hex CE42. We go back and I give it a CE42 PI code, internal RDS, give it a PS name. Coincidentally, I've already done this. And at that point, we should be able to save it. Confirm changes. Now, this is a different preset than we're running. So right now, I don't have it active. Um, I can change it by hitting the drop down, or I can select it in the preset menu. So now we are running the preset with the RDS. Um, one thing that has changed with the new AUI, actually not just the new AUI, um, the new software payloads in general, is that uh, on the VS, if you're running current software, you can look at your RDS uh, messaging on the front panel of the transmitter. And we didn't have that before. So that's, uh, that's another update that's been kind of cool. I'll see a couple of things in chat, but I haven't paid attention to see if they're current or not. Yeah, the user's admin. I haven't changed it. It's default, whatever. And, and uh, so the there's another one. We It used to be we only set the one super user. It was Nautel with no password. And uh, we decided that that was arguably even, uh, you know, we make fun of barracks for not having a password. And then we were doing the same thing. So... Uh, that's also improved with the change me. There is a viewer level that has no password by default, but it's a look, but don't touch. So you can view the settings, but not change them. All right. Um, so now if we go back to the main panel, and if you just click the icon, you're there. Now you can see we've got the RDS there. And it's just broadcasting static right now, but I could... Uh, quite easily be sending the uh, metadata in from an automation system and just tell it that I want RDS over IP or over uh, ASCII over IP or UECP. The other thing we've got to improve and um, anybody who's read one of our books will agree with me, I think. If you look in the book at RDS, it tells you all the fields and what they are, but it doesn't tell you what they do or how to configure them. So that that's something I'd like to see that improve as well. But again, y'all got to give me the, the suggestions because we live and die by your feedback. All right. Comments, questions, criticisms, thoughts so far. Wilson, what makes it hard for you? What is the drop off you have on the left side in your baseband? The drop Before off on pilot. the left side? Well, yeah, I got before the pilot, you've got a pretty slope drop off there pretty high slope 
Depends on, I've got no idea what Justin's running for audio on this. He may be running a one kilohertz tone for all I know. Um, looking at the ringing down in the uh, hash, I'm guessing that's what he's probably doing is hitting it with a heavy tone. I see he's got it uh, pretty steady at 100% modulation, so I do not know. But yeah, that is going to be your left plus right audio is there. So whatever it is, that's what you're going to see. Okay. That's your L, yeah, L plus R. I'm just L plus wondering R. why it's got yeah. such a slope in it. Yeah, it, look, it looks like you've got a lot, it's sloping off the high end. Well, and if I, let's see here. I don't know if I <clears> can <throat> do that. I've got to remember this. Click on there. So I see a pretty heavy four or 500 hertz presence. Yeah. That's what so, I'm saying. It's yeah, true. and that may come back. This card also, or this transmitter also has the Orban processor in it, I believe. <clears throat> Let's go to settings. That must be some kind of heavy-duty bass boost. No, he's got it on country medium. Let's take a look and see what it looks like. Let's see, AGC, yeah. And the EQ, it's got a fair bit of bass game, but it's not huge. I was just curious because it was quite a slope there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the bass is emphasized a lot more than the uh, higher frequencies in the mid band. So again, it depends what he's hitting it with. So, okay. I mean, it is a, uh, a tri-band variable... Uh, variable frequency uh, equalizer in it. Well, it's essentially a 5500. We haven't changed the uh, Orban card since the VS. So it's the same processor. And I mean, you can go in and you can uh, tweak stuff as you want to. And um, yeah, it's a little slow, but there you go. You can tweak it, you can save it if you want to do a custom preset. <clears throat> so you've got a fair bit of flexibility there as well. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and that, like I say, that's very similar to what it was before. Um, because it sends the command to the transmitter and then pulls the response, there is a little bit of delay to it. So you can see as I change things, there's that little, about a half second delay between hit go and seeing the response echoed back. Um, but it's a lot closer to real time than the older version was. Uh, we're using a much bigger processor than we had in the... Uh, VS with the old ARM processor, so that helps a lot. And let's see, notifications, just standard set up your uh, IP, your email server stuff for uh, notifying you of alarms and things. One thing that has changed, let me go back to that main menu again, is used to be we had uh, system settings and user settings and guaranteed you were going to choose the wrong one for whatever command you wanted. Well, we eliminated that, just merge them together. So it's just the one settings command now. And let's see, Spectre mask. Let's put the FCC mask on and go back. Don't remember if I had to save that or not. Settings. Do, 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 Spectre mask. Yeah, FCC save, sorry. Again, icon driven. And it also tells you, see in the lower right corner, if you screw something up and it won't save, you'll get a little red unsuccessful notification as opposed to this little green, yeah, it worked notification. I have it muted. I'm on a Zoom thing here. I'm listening a little bit for a while. All right. So, so let's do a ref. Actually, let's X that out and open it. Where do we go? Like there's a card pointer right next to it. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm not seeing that mask. So there you go. Bug report. Let's see. Innovonics has figured out a way to decode the Morse code FSKID. That is a good thing. Um, and, and I did see uh, Ben talking about that. And by the way, just for what it's worth and not related to this at all, the VX can all do FSK. It's uh, configured on the front panel, not uh, not remotely. Um, the goal being to keep people from tweaking it after it's set. 
Uh, will the new AUI work on phone? Yeah, Kevin. Uh, so the cool thing about this is it is HTML5. So as you can see, I'm just running it, running it in Chrome on my laptop here. Anything with a web browser that you've got the IP address and network access on, you should be able to see it. We're going to make a left of miles. So that will be a whole lot clearer than, uh, than what we had before. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Because, yeah, right now, if you want to do um, remote access, Talking you can do it on your phone with, uh, with um, uh, like, I'm using uh, real VNC on mine. But you're absolutely right to do it, uh, you know, natively on a browser. That That is way cool and not have Flash. So that's pretty much where it's at right now. Like I said, the GV, hopefully in the next couple of uh, months, we'll start seeing that rolling out. In the VS, if I was a betting man, I'd say before mid next year, but not much sooner. I mean, that thing we've uh, we've discovered everything we could possibly screw up. Um, being able to monitor audio from the transmitter still on the short list absolutely is. Uh, beyond that, not just from the transmitter. Well, not not from the transmitter, but over the AUI. Um, the goal is to have the ability to just click and do a confidence monitor from wherever you are. So, yeah. Now, that is not, not here right now. And I don't know how far down the road it is. It's the same. The other thing, like if you've got a VS transmitter, and this is something important to note. Um, you remember I've been on here and Matt's been on here and we've told you over and over again, the VS, the challenge, one of the biggest challenges was 15 years of technology, four different platforms, two bootloaders, three firmware payloads and a partridge in a pear tree. And the issue is that the ARM processor is so overtaxed that uh, going to the new AUI, one of the challenges is one of the things you're going to lose is the audio player. So if you're using the audio over USB, you do not want to upgrade to this AUI on a VS. Now, it's not on the VX or anything else right now either, but that will be coming soon on the VS. I wouldn't bet my paycheck that we're ever going to see it. So just keep that in the back of your mind. I mean, we're not planning on discontinuing support for the Flash app. So you've still got an alternative, but you do need to be aware of that. This is why Barry brings me back because I don't like to you know, sugarcoat stuff. We like the fact that you tell us right the way it is. Yeah. Well, and, and as I get older and crankier, I'm less inclined to, uh, to, to bother because uh, I, I, who was it? Ray Reed. Anybody know Ray Reed, our specialties out of Texas. And Ray has a phrase. He goes, my give a shit activity is at an all time low today. And uh, it, it, it's it's not incorrect. I mean, it, it's just the older I get, it, it's just easier to tell you where we're at. And like I say, where we're at right now is I see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think for the first time in a long time, it may not be a train, but uh, there's still a long way to go. Well, I so think it, the key ports, points to that, and, and, and I'll pat you on the head a little bit, at least, you know, sort of uh, electronically is that um, some manufacturers will tell you something is coming ready. They're going to ship it. And I have seen people, everything from transmitters to antennas, and a couple have almost lost their jobs because the salesman knew going in that they couldn't deliver on the time frame they promised. And I know that you don't do that, and you will bust your butt to live up to your word. It's... I appreciate that. Well, it's an ongoing challenge, and I'll be the first to tell you that AUI in particular has turned me into a liar much more than I'd like. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, my first and, and part of it comes back to design people in general, if you ask them for an estimate, we'll give you an estimate based on everything working the way we expect it to work. Um, how many people in here have done done a project, any project, and had 100% of the things go the way they expected them to go? Um, you know, it, it doesn't happen. And design people tend to be the eternal optimists. So typically, I, I, uh, 
my wife, I, I call her a pessimist and she goes, no, I'm a realist because stuff sucks more than it doesn't suck. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't necessarily put it like that exactly, but, uh, but yeah, so engineering will give me an estimate and I'll usually double that and add three months. And that tends to get me a little closer. And why is Ken putting that terrible picture of my bald spot on his screen? Oh, um, you're talking about Jeff's butt. I've got the front angle of it. here. <laughs> that, uh, I, don't, I don't even know when that picture was taken. T-A-B. Oh, what was I breaking at the time? Or had I dropped something? I don't even know when I was tying my shoes. Um, I better not say. Uh-oh. Okay, there we go. This is another one of those stories that uh, there may have been alcohol involved. No, I don't think there was at that point. Mary's laughing because Mary and I have a few of those stories. Oh, there you got me actually almost, I won't say intelligent, but looking uh, awake. See, this is the problem. You get these photo stalkers. So side note, I was in a grocery store two days ago, three days ago, locally here. And I'm back in the dairy section and this guy is like, Jeff, Jeff Welton. And I turn around and there's a guy there who I don't know. And I did what every sales guy goes when somebody calls you got name by name, go, oh, hey, and hold the hand out. And he shakes a hand and didn't have a gun in it, thank goodness. Um, and he's like, I'm so-and-so. And I said, oh, cool. He turned out he's the engineer for one of the local stations. He recognized me from TTT. So, uh, you know, it, it's like I say, it's, uh, I'm Bridgewater famous, man. I tell you what, there are like five people that know who I am just uh, by looking at uh, me in a store. Um, Jeff, uh, just a, yeah. a quick uh, administ trivia note here. Uh, uh -huh. Because we record this as full screen, uh, pictures of you aren't, aren't being shown. And Good. So of you on YouTube, <laughs> uh, YouTube has changed again. And I do not know immediately how to bring the chat box up if you wanted to ask a question or make a comment. So at the moment, all you can do is send an email to Barry at oldradio.com. Uh, and I'll try to see it while we're here. If somebody knows how to bring the chat screen up on the YouTube feed, let me know and I'll try to do that. There you go. And uh, by the same token, jwelton at notel.com. If you get any questions and I'll hit you up afterwards, I don't do email while I'm, uh, while I'm here for obvious reasons, because I can't multitask. Um, what, what do they say? Multitasking is doing a bunch of things poorly, um, at least when I'm doing it. So any other questions on the AUI? I mean, I know Matt's been on here a bunch of times doing the run through and I don't want to, you know, reinvent the wheel or regurgitate stuff. Um, it, it is, like I said, really nice to see it out the door. Uh, let's see. I have you... one more very old question. Okay. Can the, can the scheduler change from year to year? So that is, and that question goes back to that NX 10 years, NX5, NV5. I forget which transmitter, but I remember when you asked it. NX5. Let's see. So if we go to the preset and the preset scheduler, let's take a peek here. So we'll, yes, I am sure we'll enable the scheduler. Let's add a rule. Okay. Tell me what I've got to do to uh, make this happen. I'm going to rely on you here, Ken. You're muted. Unmute yourself. We weren't able to change the, um, I have, I had to run. I don't. I'm not there anymore. I had to right. run a pre-sunrise, so all the other power changes we just kept on standard time, and we synchronized the clock to Phoenix. Right. Um, but when you go to pre-sunrise, it follows local time, which follows daylight savings time. Uh, and no, the FCC uses standard yes. time across the board. No, not for pre-sun, not our post-sun. All right. They use what's called local time. And local time follows daylight savings. And so I set up a year. Then I went to the next year, and I noticed everything was already there. 
So I thought, well, that's handy. Let me just change now the daylight savings change Mm -hmm. and went back to the present year and it had changed it there. And I called you all about it and you said, yeah, uh, right. That's a problem. Yeah. And it does not, as I look at this, like when you go in to add a new one, it does not give you the ability to select the year. It's a uh, month and day. So like I can do January 1st to uh, or January 1st to December 31st, or I could do January 1st. But, uh, and I mean, for scheduling historically anyway, and I'm not sure when they changed it, but it always used to be that you could just use standard time because when the time change happened, it offset the uh, time uh, the the power change as well. That's what we did on everything. But like I said, the pre sunrise doesn't follow standard non adjusted time. It follows right. local time. Gotcha. Local time follows daylight savings. Yeah. So it'll change every year. Right. And the only way to do that would be the first day of that to change it to the new schedule and then you're good for the year. But you're right. You would have to change it once a year, every year. Yeah. And so that one, I know that is still on the wish list because I know I remember when you and I talked about it and it ended up on the spreadsheet very quickly because you were uh, persistent. Well, we just bought that transmitter, and that was the reason was that scheduler. And um, bingo, it didn't yeah. work. So, uh, Jeff held that, on that a simple was, little uh, radio now. button so that when the internet knows that it's moved to uh, the uh, daylight time, that it makes the change automatically. The, the Yeah, I mean, it would be one of those, you could add it so that, uh, here, let's go back to this one that I set up. You could add it so that, uh, do I want this one to change on daylight savings time or not? Because as Ken said, some do and some don't. So uh, that would be one option. The other option is to just give you the year and say from January 1st of this year to December 31st the next year or whatever. Um, I like the radio button, follow daylight savings or no, but that also assumes that you've got internet connection to it. And a lot of people don't always. Yeah, well, you've got to because the clocks on those things would get way out of whack real quick if you weren't uh, synced to a server. Yep. Yeah. If you're doing uh, pattern change, you almost need to GPS clock it. Um, Also, Mark has asked, uh, new AUI, GB, how much changes with SNMP? So short answer is everything. Um, When you go from the Flash AUI to the HTML5 AUI, because for one example, like I said before, with the settings, we went from two menus to one menu and uh, various other things in the the presets, um, the entire MIB, the entire management information base is going to change. So you're going to need to download and uh, up and install a new MIB file into your uh, SNMP based remote, no matter what SNMP manager you're using. So yeah, um, Chris has got a good point. Now I am 100% behind getting rid of daylight savings. And I told somebody I said, I don't care whether we standardize on daylight savings, whether we standardize on standard time, or whether we split the difference and just go down the middle as a one time change where everybody resets everything they've ever owned. But uh, just, uh, yeah, stop messing around those of us that uh, don't uh, work well with time change is uh, just, uh, yep, stop it. Just don't. Now that I work from home, it's easy. Let's see. What about the NV series? Did I close? I did close. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. I am going to see if, I don't think there's anything in my browser history that I don't mind showing you. So let's right there. I'll go back to that uh, roadmap. Log in. Now you're going to get the warning that that password has been compromised. Oh, yep, yeah, there it is, close. So the question was, what about the NV, the original NV series? And I'm going to be honest. If I go over to the right, TBD is what's written here. And again, this is one of the things that's supposed to be resolved in today's meeting. But at this point, I don't even have a guess on when the NV series will be done. I can promise you it'll be last because the current production stuff takes precedence. But uh, when 
I talking to Mike Woods and Mike is our head of engineering and Mike was very honest about the fact that he would really, really like to see it done before he retires. And that's targeted for end of 2026, 25, 26. So again, I'm pessimistic. I don't know that it'll be done by the end of 25, but it will be done. The, the good thing is, so the VS, I, I gave you the song and dance about the ARM processor and all the different iterations. Um, once we've got that one done, the low power NV lights and, or all the NV lights and the low power NXs also use ARM processors. So we'll have pretty much resolved all those problems ahead of time of VS. The GV uses a, a single board computer as a controller. So does the high power NX and the, um, and the original NV series. So once we get GV done, we'll have resolved most of those problems ahead of time. So getting those two first ones, the GV and the VS done, should, and I'm going to emphasize should, because unlike a design engineer, I'm realistic or pessimistic, depending on how you look at it, but that should uh, help make those ones flow a lot more smoothly, at least a lot less unsmoothly, to put it bluntly. All right, something else in the chat. What do we got here? MIB translation table um, be available for the OIDs? No. Um, I don't think, Alan. I think what we'll probably do, typically, anytime we come out with a new product, we issue a new MIB for it. Um, I Translating from the new to the old is its own particular brand of uh, challenge. So, I, uh, and again, this is not something I'm really strong on, so I'm regurgitating something I was told when I asked the question once. But I can almost guarantee that you'll get a new MIB for the new uh, AUI. And uh, where, I guess where that would be an issue if you were running your own SNMP manager and enrolled your own, then, uh, then that might be useful. So I'll, I'll definitely keep the note. Just copying. Um, and, and, you know, definitely, if that's the situation, like, let me know, the, the, you know, send me an email and give me the background story to it. So I understand the why too, because usually if I go to engineering, first thing I'll say is I need a translation table. The first thing they'll say is, why do you want that? And I'd be like, I don't know, because somebody asked for it. But if you give me a why you need it, it makes it a lot easier for me to go to them and say, I need this because you know, uh, uh, beyond a customer asked for it. So yeah, absolutely. That's again, one of those little inside things. Any, any other questions or comments? We might be done a little early today if I uh, don't think other stuff to talk about. Jeff, would you uh, show folks uh, the input uh, activity here with the new AUI that if somebody brings in a signal of a certain level and they want to raise or lower that level? Sure. Is it still backwards? Oh, yeah. It, and it's not backwards. Well, it is. Let's go back. It doesn't matter. I can stick at this preset and just go to edit. So the way the audio level works, let's go to audio. You're, what you're doing is setting the level that references 100% modulation. So if your audio level is a little lower, you're going to set your reference level for 100% lower. So to make it louder, you turn it down. Turn it down to turn it up is the way I describe it. So yeah, you're not actually adjusting the audio output. You're setting the reference level for 100%. Did I explain that really poorly and confuse the hell out of everybody? No, I think that makes a lot of no tell sense. Let's see. I missed why your scheduler was resetting the RDS every day. Ken, you're going to have to uh, explain. Go back to the scheduler screen now, uh, just and you'll see it. Every day there it said reschedule RDS, preset RDS. All right. So let's see, preset scheduler. See, every day it's saying reset oh, with... No, it says preset with RDS. That was the preset that I chose when I configured it. So look, if I uh, go... So I had uh, created this and that's what I called it. So I could have picked preset one instead. 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And now it should there. Now it says preset one. Okay. Okay. So, I yeah, saw that. that that's all I that thought, was. Oh my that was, God. Reset yeah, no. the RDS every day. And I thought maybe <laughs> it synced the clock or something. No, nope, no, nope. that was just the name of the preset that I happened to choose. I probably should have picked a better name for it. Okay, but, uh, just, the letters are so little on the screen. Okay. Yeah, here, let's, there, make it a little bigger. That's uh, incidentally, because it is HTML based, one of the other cool things about it is I can go from having two things on the screen to having four things on the screen and it will resize as I resize. So that that's kind of cool. And I'm just hitting the control button and using the scroll wheel on my mouse to adjust the size. You can do the uh, view and zoom in as well. So I like that one just because it lets me control the again the long term goal once we get this all 100% done and the, the, the first priority is to get it out there for y'all. And after that, we'll go through and make it prettier and, and fix the, the warts that are on it. And one of the ones will be to have it auto configure. So if I pick up my phone and go to the website or go to the URL for the or the IP address for my transmitter, it'll detect that I'm using a phone and auto size the display. So I'm not looking at a big wall of text mashed into a little tiny space. If I use a tablet, it'll resize accordingly. And again, with a laptop. So uh, that, again, that's a, a long-term goal. MIB translation table would make it easier for reprogramming existing remotes. Well, and again, reprogramming existing remotes, it depends how you do it. Like with Davicom, you just load and uh, automat the same way. You just load the new MIB file into it and you're ready to roll. Um, where I guess if you wanted to, okay, this one's power, this one's not. Yeah, understood. All right. No, nope. it just took me a little while to wrap my head around it. So what Alan's asking for is uh, like an OI, a MIB, a management information base is made up of a whole bucket load of OIDs, object identifiers. And each object identifier tells you everything from internet down to manufacturer, down to piece of equipment, down to module, down to circuit board, down to specific forward power, reflected power, et cetera, whether it's an analog or a digital reading. And so knowing that that OID changed from this version of the uh, HTML5 AUI versus the flash AUI, knowing what forward power is in that one versus this one would be a whole lot easier because then you can, uh, you, you, the um, software can know where to look. So you're right, there's, uh, th there will be some, uh, some learning curve there and there may be some documentation required. So that's a good point. Wilson, I hope you took a note on that. On your older one, you could have four screens up there with graphs on it. Uh -huh. um, um, this one, can you have several pages up where you just tab from one well, to the other? So right now, the only graph that we've got, let's, oops, that's settings, edit. The other ones are not actually being used at this point. Um, the goal instrument panels right now, we've allowed, we set it as four data panels and one instrument panel. You can't really tab between them, no. Um, for my money on this one, the spectrum analyzer is the one that I would likely use. If I was running HD, I might use the list as you plot sometimes as well. Yeah. And if I was running HD, then I definitely want the constellation. Yeah, so, exactly. Again, I it, it, it isn't the plan right now, but it would be really nice to be able to switch this, for example, over to one of the data panels. So if I close the alarms, maybe put the spectrum analyzer over there. And yeah, I guess you can do that. So there you go. Maybe I want to put the uh, audio inputs over here. So yeah, you can pick and choose what goes where. Maybe I want the spectrum analyzer because I can't pick these ones. So, so there, does that answer the question? Yeah, it's pretty close, pretty close. So, so yeah, as we add more, and right now you only have the one, uh, 
there let's put those i guess i could have just restored it but the, where would the fun be so right now i've only got the one instrument panel but i do have the choice over to the right whether i'm putting instruments or data or whatever let's see here let's go with the yeah, once you get it all done then you can go back and put the chrome on it right yeah and that's what i say the big goal first is to get it out to y'all and uh you know with the vx we've started doing that uh, there are several hundred of them in the field now knock on wood they've been really solid so um what would you know what the biggest issue with the aui on the flash base oh so there stony asks can you make the temperature you're gonna love me for this if i can remember how to do it um is it under settings Transmitter time. I never ever remember where we do this. Transmitter info? No. Let's see, just bear with me. System preferences Celsius, Fahrenheit, save. Done and dusted. So there you go. It's uh, now speaking in Fahrenheit degrees. This that is was something. Oh, well, ahead. and that was something y'all have been asking us for that forever. So yeah, that was one of the, and the funny thing is we uh, did the upgrade and the first thing we did, anytime you do a new software release, the first thing you do is break it. Um, when they fixed the re, the break, the, the broken release and came out with the patched release, they had removed the ability to switch from centigrade to Fahrenheit and I think it was pretty unanimous. The entire sales team's like, I, that, 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 no, 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 no. So yeah, no, the ability to switch to met or from metric to English is, uh, is part of the program now. And on the flash one, you could program what inputs would do. Um, but you never had, and I asked about this before, if, if it was possible to possibly put in one or two, uh, Analog. analog inputs or something where you could monitor right. building temperature and tower lights and then you wouldn't have to yeah. buy any kind of remote control right and that gets into i mean a logic level input is easy to do because that's you look for a high you look for a low reading an analog input requires much different hardware well, much different it's a different ic um, could we have developed it in this? Possibly, but I don't believe that you're going to find it in this. You've still got the ability to program your I.O., but uh, you don't have as much. And remember that the VX2 was originally, the, the VX in general was designed to be sort of a, a more budget conscious product. So we weren't spending a lot of time adding bells and whistles that uh, that required more expensive components. Is there any way there can be an indicator on your GUI if one of these inputs is closed? Oh, yeah. Now, on, on your GUI, you mean on the front panel? Yeah. So you could see like, oh, the tower lights are on or oh, the door's open. What you could do with the older one this one i don't think we used again on the vx i don't think we've got the full site control on it um that one i'll have to play with a little bit on the nv lights and the gvs with the site control you do have the ability to trigger an alarm if you uh if you set a if you program an external input absolutely you can do that now on your existing one so it's just a matter of if this threshold goes high or low, activate, you know, it's part of the site control parameter, tell it to activate an alarm. Um, Where did you that appear on the screen? Under the site controller, it's not as part of this oh, one. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no, you won't see it on this. You may see it on the GV. I will have to look. I have not messed with the GV. It's still so early in the alpha stages. I don't like to share anything until it's at least somewhat close to being a real product. Will it do degrees Kelvin? Unfortunately, no, but hey, take the Fahrenheit and multi or subtract, what is it, 273? And uh, you should be there. I think that's right. Zero degrees Kelvin is minus 273 Celsius. Is that right? Can't you get a chip for that too? For what? Degrees Kelvin? Yeah. Oh, that's just software. 
that's just a few lines of code. All I need is a guy to write it and somebody who wants to speak it. All right, anything else? Quiet. The one other thing I did want to talk about very briefly is that uh, if you look at the Waves newsletter, we are, and I say they're, they're, I I don't think it's a promotion really. And uh, I have the conversation early about marketing guys versus uh, real life and uh, being a little optimistic. Yep. Um, I don't know what orifice John pulled this number out of. Ooh. And Wilson's shaking his head already. <laughs> I had this con- or conversation, but uh, let's see. So we do have a cost of operation calculator. I know what numbers he used, um, and he used 17 and a half cents per kilowatt hour, which in some parts of the North America is a valid number. But I know like I deal in the Midwest, most of my customers are between eight and 10 cents a kilowatt hour, give or take. But just to give an example, like if I take a 10 kilowatt and let's pick 10 cents a kilowatt hour instead of 19, let's put it at 10 kilowatts on the nose and say we're replacing an existing solid state transmitter, like an ND, ND10 would be about 75% overall efficient, 24, 7, 365. So at a ballpark, we're going to save if we went to 60B MDCL, the aggressive one, we'd save about $5,700 a year. Now, that's not a huge amount, but hey, 500, four, 500 bucks a month is not insignificant either. So it is something to consider by, by any definition. Uh, if you go with a more conservative MDCL, like the 3DB, the one that has the least amount of impact on your uh, fringe, then you're down to closer to 4,500 bucks a year, but again, some savings. So that is something that we are putting a fairly hard push because uh, I think we're still the only manufacturer out there that, uh, well, no, BE is still doing low power AM, but they don't do MDCL at all. Um, Gates Air did do MDCL, but they don't do AM at the moment. I, I think they're coming back. They're talking about coming back. So that'd be cool to see. But uh, anyway, so this is something that we are putting a pretty hard push on at the moment. So uh, if you reach out to Mr. Wilson, oh, he's still there. He hasn't left screaming yet. Or me or, uh, oh, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know, it hasn't been announced yet, Ted's retiring. So, uh, you know, after 70 years, I think he's only been doing this for 40 or 50. But uh, but yeah, so uh, I think we just posted an ad for an East Coast sales rep. If anybody wants to, you know, go start selling transmitters for a living. Mary. Hey, Mary. Does that include uh, Maine? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. Now, he, uh, let's see, my territory, I cover from uh, Alabama, working north, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, and Michigan, all points east of that. That would be what you'd be looking at. So the theory was when Chuck Kelly originally defined our sales territories, we all had northern states to go to in the summer and southern states to go to in the winter. And the theory was we could escape the snow. Uh, I'm here to tell you, I've been in uh, I've been in Atlanta when there was three inches of snow on the ground. So I'm not sure how that worked because the snow seems to follow me. I think it's my fault. So you're the problem with the climate change. Yeah, I am the problem. There now, Tim mentions that your uh, USVI, you're looking at 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, I can vouch for the fact that Hawaii is in the 40s. There is a really cool website, the US uh, Energy Information Administration gives fairly current data on both residential, commercial and industrial, as far as uh, power rates go. And they break it down by state. Now, having said that, you know, they're going to base it on like TVA in Tennessee, but not the independent uh, contractors who may give it for more or less. So it it gives you a rough guide, but uh, power bill is by far the best way to go for that. All right, more stuff. Let's see. Yeah, it's not Mary. Mary, you're not the problem. That's me. Yeah, what do they say? It's not you, it's me. Um, 
Yeah. Any chance the legacy AUI launcher could have a column for the call sign? Rather, look, between you, me, and the French post, that has been requested many, many times, including by me, where the long term goal is to resolve pretty much everything to HTML5 at some point. I don't think that there's going to be a lot of clock cycles put into changing the uh, the access app, but uh, but I'm not 100% sure. We have requested it, so that's all I can tell you. So I will keep asking. What happened to the FRM coverage tool calculator? That's still there. There. Notel.com. It's not just FM, by the way. Here, let's uh, hit that. That's a little side note. We're at 402, but that's okay. You click on the support tab. And then you have to either sign in. Or if you go there, it's going to tell you to sign in. So you sign in. And they say with Nug, whatever. Um, you sign in. It's uh, Let's Marketing Track You. They'll send us a report. I haven't done it for a couple of years. I think they gave up on us. But, uh, yeah, the coverage tool is still in here. Uh, you'll notice the note that it does not work with uh, HTTP, so you do have to um, allow it and disable the protection. But uh, once you've done that, you can get in there. Um, the reason I say it's not just FM, you can put in pretty much any frequency with a few exceptions. Uh, I like doing point-to-point -point STL hops. Like here is a, uh, that's a, let's see here. Do I have an SPTL hot? Well, let's pick one. So let's go 900 megahertz. Uh, we're not shooting from Eagle Butte. Let's go Dean's house. So that's uh, where my studio used to be in one of our our uh, board director board uh, members. We'll just submit it as is. I'm not going to re rebuild the whole thing. It'll take it quite a while to calculate because I had the granularity up. But yeah, so you can do a point-to-point -point STL hop. Other thing that's important is you'll notice that the ground cover is shown. And uh, the reason this is important is because if you use, for example, uh, Ubiquiti's AirBridge, it does not show ground cover. And if you've got 60 feet of old growth forest in your path, that can be an issue. And I mean, that's why, for example, this one, AirBridge, it said we had a clear shot, but uh, turns out we would have had to go really high up to clear the uh, trees and they wouldn't let us put a big old tower at the studio end. So that uh, that's why we're running fiber on our particular site right now. But yeah, so the, uh, the coverage calculator is there. You can also plot. Let me get back to the main page. I got to remember where. There. Uh, I don't want to create a new transmitter site. Yeah, I mean, you can pick it wherever you want, though. And uh, let's scroll over to Wilson's backyard. Well, Wilson, I lost Quincy. Uh-oh. This is how bad I am at this game. I don't even remember where they put Quincy. Somewhere near St. Louis. You got to go north. Uh, that's my problem. I probably already had a bookmarked. Springfield, Jacksonville. Am I north or south now? It's to the left and north. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Look for the neon gate sign. There you go. Just, just north of Hannibal there. Oh, there. Look at that. I'm just blind and old. That's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. So you can uh, pick a place and let's go roundabout, I don't know, right here. Let's go in Wilson's backyard. And we can uh, place cursor at center. Let's move it a little more. There, I think that's more his driveway, but whatever. So this is now a transmitter site. And we'll call it. Trouble one, add to my transmitter sites. So now we can do a coverage plot using that site. We can uh, pick, let's go 91 meters, sure. And we can do a custom plot. Is a, There's a bunch of defaults, but say we got a, a thousand foot or a thousand watt transmitter, a little bit of line loss. Um, let's do a six dB gain, that's a four bay. Uh, eight bay 
then let's do a 5440 plot or 5460 plot rather. So this is all, and, and like I say, we do through the uh, through your login, we do track it, but uh, nobody has done anything with it for so many years that, uh, yeah, you know, we're not going to hassle you. Just go ahead and use it. And we wait a little while and we'll see what our one kilowatt into the uh, 6 dB antenna will do if we uh, put it in... Um, in that particular part of the world at uh, 91 meters is close to 300 feet. Now this, uh, for what it's worth, um, Roger Coudé from uh, what the name, what is the name of radio something? I, I forget, but uh, it, it was originally designed for ham, uh, ham radio. And it's uh, Something that, uh, again, Chuck Kelly got uh, Roger to adapt it for Radio Mobile was the original company. But Roger still does a fair bit of maintenance on it. So it, it's kept pretty current. And the elevation maps are, are actual USGS. There we go. One more percent. Of course, it'd be like every other software update. That last percent takes 99% of the time. And see, I'm not lying. There we go. All right. So if we put a kilowatt at 300 feet in that particular neck of the woods, we'd have pretty good coverage down around Quincy and Hannibal. Little, little low as you get into Hannibal, and you can see the 54 versus the 60. So it, uh, it it's not a bad little tool for uh, plotting coverage, and it does use Longley Rice, so... You know, with all the caveats that comes with it, it's going to be better than better than my best guess. But uh, but there are going to be areas where it doesn't uh, exactly meet up. All right. I see Dave's got his hand up here. Yeah. That that was from before. I wanted to ask about the tool toolkit. Yep. I just uh, typed. Okay, so yeah, so it is still there. It's just like I say, click on the support tab to the right and do the NUG login. If you don't have a NUG account, create one, whatever. Um, you do have the ability to opt out of any emailings. We don't send a lot anyway. I think uh, I get the Waves newsletter. We do that three or four times a year, and that's about it other than uh, the Nugget NAB event. So yeah, we're not going to spam you a whole bunch. We haven't figured that part out yet probably for the best. Um, Kevin mentions that he did find an area of the maps that was inverted and, and it's been fixed. So there you go. All right. So we're 10 after the top of the hour. I did tell Justin that I was going to uh, leave his transmitter alone at uh, 415 so he could unplug it and go home. But uh, by the way, the, we do also have the ability with the remote, of course, I think I showed it earlier. But, oops, unless I could have gone dashboard. Uh, it is turned on. So yeah, we've got it running here all this time. And if you go to turn it off, it will make you verify. Um, you see the local remote. One of the thing worth mentioning, if you leave the transmitter in local, when you log in, this entire top dash bar will be red. So it gives you a big old, hey, dummy, you left it in local. Um, you know, and uh, it, it's not as good as a red light by the door, but at least it gives you an indication that, uh, that yeah, you're in local. All right. So on that note, folks, if there's anything else, great, I'll handle it. And if not, we'll call it a day. Well, Jeff, as always, we really appreciate your expertise, your experience, both from the sales and the tech support side, which has been so invaluable to so many folks. Someday somebody's going to listen to the recording and I'm going to have a meeting with HR. <laughs> Yep. So I, I really appreciate being here too, Barry. Thanks very much for having me. And uh, we'll, uh, and other thing, folks, if there's anything that you want to talk about any one of the weeks that I'm on, it doesn't have to be about not tell transmitters. I'll talk about just about anything. Yeah, we're uh, about food. ready to get back to grounding again, I think. <laughs> it's we're, we're about due. Uh, yeah. And I mean, now go figure we're coming out of lightning season. This would be a great time to talk about grounding. You, uh, you raised my, my <clears throat> thought pattern. Uh, with this uh, business of inspecting a site and uh, looking for problems. And 
you know, that's certainly an issue if you are brand new to a station. That's something oh. that should be done. So if you get the Waves newsletter, um, a little tale out of school because I can do it. And yeah, I know we're recording, so I'll be gentle. Um, I had a customer called, he'd been investing a lot more money into parts and combiners and power amps than we would expect for the particular model he had. And uh, he's back and forth with support and they're getting frustrated and he's getting frustrated. And he finally calls me. And so I kind of, you know, we go back and talk a little bit and he's hesitant to give us information on uh, on the site in general, just that it's a really good site. So one day I gave his engineer a shout and it's like, I'm in Nashville. It's only a four or five hour drive. How about I jump on the interstate and hop over and uh, we'll take a look. So I toddle on over and we take a look and that became the subject for this recently, yesterday's released news, Waves newsletter. So, uh, you know, yeah, it was uh, just and a nice building, wonderfully air conditioned, terribly grounded. You know, and, and yeah, stuff happens. So, so we want to approach it from, we can do it from two directions. One, you're brand new to a site and you want to make your initial inspection or what you just mentioned here, uh, finding uh, the troubleshoot key yeah. uh, to, to making things work right. Right. And I mean, the, the best way to put it as a rule, and, and I'll emphasize as a rule, because there are some areas, if you're down in Florida, you expect to see a little more lightning damage than if you're, say, in Seattle. But when I say a little more, I'm not talking an amp or two a storm. I'm talking two or three a year instead of one every couple of years. So if you're seeing more than that, odds are there's stuff we can do with respect to grounding. And, and absolutely, you know, we're happy to look at that stuff. You know, I haven't gosh. said ferrites yet. I am. Um, the, the problem is that ferrites got to be such a catchphrase that everybody's, oh, yeah, he's just going to say add ferrites. And if you don't have good grounding and properly installed search ferrites protection, all that's going to be the whole answer. Well, other than the fact that it's fun to watch them explode when they get a really big surge. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've kind of, I, it's not that I don't think they make a difference. I do still think they make a difference, but only after you've done the grounding and the search protection. Let's make that part of our discussion next time. Cool. All right. So I guess we've got October's topic taken care of. We do. And for October, let's see, October, what's our date? Um, October count. the 5th. I will be on the way. I'll, I'll schedule my trip. I'm going to be doing a frequency change in South Dakota around about the 6th or 7th. So I'll make it a point to be in a hotel for the right time on the 5th. Okay. But Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Hey, my pleasure. All right, folks. Well, we'll see you all later. Bye, Jeff.